because one megabyte costs two and a half euros. And you know, very small price in the hotel, just 19 euros for one day. You know, this, these prices, they are, they are shocking prices for Lithuanian citizens. I think the same for other countries. And that's why is it asked for representatives, I mean before, uh, also from representatives from European Council, that we would need to equalize the, these gaps, that your internet roaming should be the same price as in the countries, but not the 10 or 20 or 100 times higher than in the countries. Then, of course, the feedback will come, how the translation, how other services work, and then we'll have a much better situation than now, and the future will look bright. Thank you very much. So, Mr. Peter Spintz. Yes. Th yes, thank you. So, um, concerning the dangers for Dutch, um, we are a bit more in a comf more comfortable situation as worldwide around 23 million people speak Dutch. So, as uh, my colleague said, you can find the details in the appropriate booklet. But, um, and the fact that I have to explain a bit what the Dutch language union is, it is an intergovernmental organization between Belgium, Flanders, and the Netherlands, and now also Suriname is an associated member. And this, this, this organization is a, dates from 90, uh, 1980. So already then, the governments of Belgium and the Netherlands have realized that it is important to have a language policy, and they created an intergovernmental organization for that. So, um, and um, the <coughs> Dutch Language Union was meant to kind of uh, unify the language of the administrations in Belgium and the Netherlands, which of course was a bit, uh, well, seen in retrospect a silly assignment because languages evolve, each has his own local uh, jargon. But on the other hand, there's also a cultural notion, meaning to promote the Dutch language and literature, and also a societal um, uh, challenge so that as also my predecessors have said, each citizen should be able to speak Dutch and use Dutch in any situation. Now, um, in, in 1980, there was not such much mention of language technology, but in 1999, the Dutch Language Union has created, together with the governments of then Flanders and the Netherlands, because uh, Flanders is a northern part of Belgium where they speak Dutch, uh, uh, the HLT platform. So this was an, um, a, a meeting place for the government officials and to, think, to start think about how to uh, provide basic building blocks for a linguistic infrastructure for Dutch. So the first project was uh, Corpus of, uh, for Spoken Dutch. And in the end, uh, well, in later on, uh, a large basic uh, language resource kit has been uh, defined. And then later on, uh, it, there was a joint, uh, jointly funded research program called STIVIN, uh, which stands for Essential uh, Language and Speech uh, Resources for Dutch. So you see that um, the, the mere fact that you have an organization that is responsible to think about a language and linguistic policy, that's already a big uh, instrument to, uh, let's say, to, to safeguard the position of your language in a modern ICT uh, society. Um, well, I'll stop here. Well, maybe one, one more thing, because uh, in the previous uh, sessions, there has been uh, meant the word IPR and so on, and, and uh, how can we, well, it was not say oblige um, uh, project uh, uh, collaborators to kind of uh, uh, donate their uh, results to these new uh, repositories. Well, one of the um, conditions for projects uh, to participate in Stivin was that at the end they had to uh, transfer the ownership of the results to the Dutch Language Union. And the Dutch Language Union has created a kind of a sub-entity called the HLT Agency and that's responsible to maintain and distribute uh, these uh, project results. So it's a kind of also government funded, uh, officially government funded 
uh, entity that takes care of the, the project results so that they is, can be, uh, if necessary, updated, that they don't lose their value, that they are not forgotten, and that then uh, more researchers know where to find them, and also that industry knows where to find them, which is still a problem for the moment. But I'll stop here. Thank you very much. And now Sabine Kirchmeier Andersen, please, from Danish perspective. Does this work? Yeah, good. Uh, I, I'm afraid I'm a little bit the naughty girl in this class because I cannot report any great things that my government is doing at the moment for language technology. Um, so uh, I'll just say a little bit about uh, the Danish language as it is. Uh, we are five million speakers. And uh, we have the, the lucky situation that we are understood by 20 million people in Scandinavia. Uh, that's a good thing, though. Uh, the language has been spoken for a thousand years. It has a rich writing tradition and all the characteristics that are normally for a language that is not threatened by uh, extinction. Uh, even so, under the, beginning, under the beginning of the last century, Danish was actually also the official language in Norway and Iceland and Greenland and the Far East. So it was a, a rather expansive language, such as many other European languages have been. So it's, it's in, more in the, in, the, in the state of diminishing, but far from dying out, people think. Uh, and there is only one minority language, which is, which is German. So it's a rather monolingual nation. And for Danes, it has been so natural that Danish was the main language in the country that they even didn't bother to write it anywhere in the constitution. So they don't, didn't, it's not even mentioned there. Uh, so so for, for the Danes, the situation is rather new that there are certainly so many different languages in the country. Uh, we have a lot of immigrants and we have a lot of English. Uh, English is spoken extensively in areas such as business life and higher education. Uh, and we are sp speaking about domain loss or diglossia in certain domains. And some researchers see this as a first step to language shift, whereas others are sort of more relaxed towards the problem. The Danish government has recently adopted a strategy of parallelism between English and Danish. And this is a rather new strategy. So they think that English and Danish should be sort of important languages in parallel. And this is, by the way, also uh, a concept that the Nordic uh, Council uh, has adopted for the Scandinavian languages so that English should be uh, used uh, in, together with the Scandinavian languages, but that of course everybody should have uh, the opportunity to use their own languages. Uh, there are two Nordic conventions. There is uh, the Nordic Language Convention that ensures every Scandinavian citizen or Nordic citizen to speak his own language in the other Nordic countries. And there is uh, a language declaration which sets up the goal for uh, language development. And uh, there, uh, language technology has a certain role. There is focus on MT and on terminology. It seems that in Sweden and Norway, um, there is a bit more development than in Denmark for these areas. And even for minority languages as Sami, there are substantial resources, even for Greenlandic. Uh, so, it's, it, the Nordic countries are in very different position. Um, what uh, the Danish government has done with this uh, strategy of parallelism uh, is not really clear at the moment. Uh, one should think that language technology should actually be used extensively in this uh, situation, but nothing has really happened uh, yet. And as you have seen uh, on the screen also, that Danish is very often in one of the last groups uh, of, of languages that have few resources, even though it considers itself as a strong language. I think I'll stop here. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much uh, uh, for all the panelists. Uh, really, we are on the schedule, but I would like to prolong a bit uh, uh, because we started later. And to open probably floor for questions and comments to panelists, maybe uh, in exchange of views, you have found another uh, comment, please take the floor as well. Uh, but I myself would like to put a bit of pepper, so to say, or, or, or salt in, 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 this, in, in these circumstances we have. You, 
we, 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 we discussed this with Mr. Roberto Cencioni, uh, who, who know very well uh, how, many, how much money are there, and uh, you know there is discussion how to distribute it. But I mentioned the vision of Ushkurai just uh, at the end, and you would like to bring this vision to politicians. If you would like to bring vision to politicians, uh, uh, you must work how to present this vision with emotions. Uh, because otherwise the budget will stay as it is. So to say, I, I would exaggerate a bit, but the question is, are Europe's languages in danger? The answer could be only they are in danger, they are in great, they are in terrible danger. Otherwise, there will be no money. <laughs> that is absolute axioma. <laughs> so maybe uh, Rimi does not, because he from Nigeria, but he's closer probably to politics, that he put more, most emotions in, 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 in his speech. So that is my just advice. Uh, if, if, and that you are a scientific community, you are a business community, and, and you are rational people and speaking with rational arguments. But people who take decisions, uh, they take decisions on the background of emotions. That is scientific result. That is not uh, fantasy. Uh, please read Antonio Damasio, you probably have read uh, wonderful books or recently Manuel Castells as well elaborated on that in communicative power uh, uh, about politics and, and, and uh, there are a lot of books by Lakoff uh, on, on, on politics which is really grounded on emotion. So be, before transferring to computers who fortunately as yet lack emotions, so let us use in full our emotions here. Please, I open the floor. Maybe somebody, or maybe from, uh, please, Sabina.